the Redeemer is coming to Zion. Heavenly Father, if we knew tonight how close we are to the coming of Christ, if we really knew how short our time was, we would not hear, we would not be sitting here so nonchalantly in your presence. There would be a detachment from the world. There would be such a hunger in our hearts. We would be lifted out of ourselves into the very presence of God. Oh, Holy Spirit, I invite you to come now. Take over this service in a supernatural way that no flesh should glow in your presence, but that we would hear from the very throne of God. Oh, Holy Spirit, minister your word. Minister to us, Lord, and give us hearing ears that we could hear what the Spirit would say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to bring you a prophetic word from the Lord tonight. The Redeemer of Zion is about to appear in his glory in our day in his church. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Now, the vision of Isaiah the prophet is about to be fulfilled. God is about to move with vengeance toward all who twisted the truth of the gospel and all who have become covetous. Isaiah spoke of our day. He spoke of the conditions in the church of the last days. He said, truth has fallen into the street. Yea, truth has failed. And he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And Isaiah is saying to us right now, let it be known that God is angry. Truth is being twisted and trampled upon. The church of Christ has become victimized by those who preach false doctrine. And God is displeased because no one will stand up and judge the perversions of truth. No one standing up to judge the perversion of truth. And it displeased him that there was no judgment. God's ministers were sitting idly by while the truth was being thrown to the ground and trampled upon. Lying spirits had found a voice in the church, and no one stood against it. True men of God refused to judge the false doctrines creeping in. Therefore the Lord said, I'll judge it myself. The Redeemer of Zion is going to come, and he's going to judge the carnality. He's going to judge our wickedness. He's going to judge our covetousness. And he's going to judge all the mockery of the truth of Jesus Christ in these last days. And he, the Lord, saw that there was no man. And he wondered that there was no intercessor. And he said, where are the men with discernment? Where are those who will show the people the truth? Because truth is falling. Few people care, few people understand. And the Lord said, I wonder why. Where are the men who stand up and discern? Show my people the truth. The Redeemer himself is about to clothe himself with vengeance, the Bible said, in zeal. And he's going to move quickly to his church with fury and holiness. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation is on his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. And he was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, the Lord says, I will repay. He's coming back to his church. Even now, the Bible said he's putting on the uniform of a glorious captain. He's coming wearing a breastplate of holiness. And he said, there's vengeance and there's fury and there's judgment. For the Lord shall judge his saints. The Lord shall judge his people. Something new, something awesome, something eternal is about to happen in the house of God. He said it's going to be sudden. It's going to be glorious. Now you've heard that the Bible predicts that in the last day everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But let's ask God now by the Spirit for an understanding. Why is he coming to his church with vengeance and fury? And why must the Lord himself return to Zion? 
Why is the Lord going to take the matter out of the servant's hands, out of the old minister's hands? He's going to take this matter of defending his truth. Why is he going to do it in his own sovereign power? It's all clearly laid out by the prophets. First of all, the Redeemer is coming to Zion because the enemy has come in like a flood against the church. The enemy has come in like a flood. The Bible, Isaiah said, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. Satan in these past few years, especially the past five, maybe ten at the most, has been flooding the church with one new doctrine after another. There's been a spirit of covetousness and carnality. Satan has poured out a demonic flood of adultery and morality and filth. John the Revelator saw it coming. This is what he warned us. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth and persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. This flood of Satan is all at war against the true church, against the overcomers. And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We are witnessing right now the devil's final attack against the chosen, the very elect. The Bible said he will seduce, if it were possible, even the chosen of God. And Daniel suggests that for a season he'll prevail. For a season, he'll be successful. The horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. He prevailed against the saints until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints would possess the kingdom. I ask you now, is Satan prevailing for a season right now? Come on now, in the United States and Canada, I tell you, for a season, Satan is prevailing. You and I know that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church of Jesus Christ in the end. But is he prevailing for a season now? Has Satan established a beachhead in the church, a stronghold? Are many, many of God's chosen being deceived? What happens in the church to this woman in the wilderness, the Bible says, until the Redeemer comes with fury and vengeance. Satan will come with another gospel, the Bible says. And Paul told us exactly how he's going to come against God's holy people to try to deceive them. We're not talking about homosexuals and drug addicts now, We're talking about overcoming saints of God, We're talking about preachers of the gospel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Oh, that's awesome. Many will come in these last days who are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Satan's stronghold in the church in the last day is a host of teachers and ministers who have been transformed by a gospel of the flesh. They have come to us as the Lord's most enlightened ministers. They sound just like the preachers of the gospel. They freely use the name of Jesus. They speak of righteousness. They use the scripture. They cast out devils. They heal the sick in the Lord's name. They do many wonderful works. But their message is not of God. It's another gospel. It's a deception. It's of the flesh and it's not of the spirit. And many of these teachers have been so deceived by the devil, they're blind to what they preach. They're preaching lies and they believe it to be the truth. They're not even aware they're the tools of Satan. Do you understand that they are men who started out right, but they're transformed by the gospel they're preaching? It's doing something in them and to them. 
And right now, these false doctrines of Satan are prevailing in the church in many areas. Multitudes of God's people are flocking to conventions and meetings to hear this other gospel, this gospel of self and prosperity and success. The gospel of the flesh is riding high in the church. Come on, Christian, wake up. Are you and I being deceived? Have we been trapped into the teachings of an angel of light from Satan? Are you being swept away by this flood that the prophets told us would sweep the church and for a season would prevail? Get into God's Word and hear the true gospel of Jesus and begin to judge now what we see and hear and compare what Jesus said to what they are saying. The Scripture proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Satan's new flood, his new gospel, is gain is godliness. Gain is godliness. Listen to this. Clearly, if you don't hear anything else I say, hear this now. It's a compromising message without repentance and, or godliness. It, pre- it promises forgiveness without repentance. All we offer people now is forgiveness. Turn on your television and listen. Happiness and forgiveness, it's all offered freely. No repentance. It's a gospel of gain. It's based on the supposition that the godly you are, the more gain you will have. Oh, listen to Paul's frightful warning. If any man teach otherwise, even other than the words of our Lord Jesus into the doctrine which is according to godliness. That man is proud. He knows nothing. He's destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Paul cried out, turn away from them. Turn away from this other gospel. Do you want to hear the true gospel, Christian? Do you want to hear what Jesus really said in this day and age of success and prosperity preaching? Do you want to know what the gospel says? Are you interested? Here it is from the words of our master himself. Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and they shall separate you from their company, and they'll reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Now here's what the Gospel says about people in these modern times in the church who are seeking after material things from the lips of Jesus himself. Woe unto you that seek to be rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for you shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did the fathers to the false prophets. The gospel of gain despises poverty. It rejects and despises the poor. Listen to what James said. He said, but you have despised the poor. You say unto him that's prosperous and dressed best with the gold rings and the fine apparel, sit up here in the good place. And to the poor you say, sit here in the low place. Sit at the footstool. This is a gospel of partiality to the prosperous and successful. And it's an indictment against the poor to whom Jesus ministered. It exalts prosperity and success. James said, Are you not partial? Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? And for you preachers of the gospel who try to tell me that he became poor, that we could become rich in houses and lands, you don't know your Bible. There it is. It said, Hath not God chosen the poor, rich in faith? How blind is the church today? How blind! Is this the gospel for a dying world? Gain is godliness. Faith is for prosperity. Poor people lack faith. 
Christ became poor so that we could be rich in material goods. He came to give us abundant life. Is abundant life supposed to be worldly goods? No, that's eternal life. Abundant life is the fullness. You and I don't have the life. We have just the seed. The life is encapsulated in that seed. And one day we're going to have abundant life. And that's eternal life in Jesus. We don't have it now. We're going to get it then. One billion people on this earth are near starvation. The heart of Jesus is breaking over the sight of weeping mothers who hold starving babies with their bloated stomachs. Millions are unemployed. The ends of the world are coming down on us. The world's headed for Armageddon. Our cities in America and Canada are about to explode again in riots. Persecution and tribulation are coming. The Bible said the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. The world's on fire. All over the world, God's chosen people are being jailed. They're being persecuted. They're losing all they possess. They're taking joyfully the sporting of their goods. And you tell me that God's going to send a man of God to tell me that I have a right to be rich? Is that a man of God who comes to me in the face of a starving world and said, use your rights, use your faith. You can be rich, you can be prosperous, you can have a bigger car, you can have a better home. What's happened to us? How blind can we be? You say that's an American message. No, it's keeping all over Canada right now. We got it all wrong. The rich man went to hell, the poor man went to heaven. From such, turn away. These preachers have no burden for repentance. They don't preach against sin. They offer blessings without sorrow. They are accumulators of this world's goods. They accumulate. I heard a preacher say, I have to be successful. I have to drive a nice car. I have to prove what I'm preaching. Makes me want to cry. Amos the prophet cried out, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, unconcerned about the evil day ahead. They lie upon beds of ivory. They stretch themselves upon their couches, and they eat the lambs of the flock, and they drink wine in bowls. And they are not grieved for the afflictions of Joseph. They're not grieved. And I shudder to think of standing before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, having preached that kind of a message. The Redeemer is coming back to Zion to break down every stronghold of the state of Satan. And he's coming back to Zion to raise up a standard of truth. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. What is this standard that's going to swallow up the flood? What kind of sovereign fury is going to be released very soon in the church? Folks, it's a sovereign fury. You can put all your books on Finney away. hundred ways to have revival. Put them away. This is a sovereign work of God to be released in the church. What is this vengeance the prophets are talking about? Hear it. It's the actual presence of God. The actual living presence of God. The church of these last days is going to experience God actually appearing in their midst. And the Redeemer shall suddenly come to Zion. That's the church. He's always come suddenly. He came suddenly at the day of Pentecost. He came suddenly to Paul. He comes suddenly, folks. One day it's not there, the next day it's here. He's going to suddenly appear in his actual presence. This time the judge is coming himself to the church. The general of the armies is coming. He's coming in power and awesome glory. Now you and I know that wherever two or three are gathered, his name, there he is in our presence, in our midst. 
But folks, that's like the ray of the sun compared to the heat of the sun. The closer you get to the sun, the brighter and the hotter. And the Lord said he's going to remove himself out of his chamber and he's going to suddenly come forth. He's going to appear in his church. The Lord will come who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and he will expose the counsels of the heart. Every preacher in this building, listen to me. Every evangelist, every missionary. You and I know God's not going to raise up a new prophet. The days of big time evangelism are over. They're over. Babylon's coming down. All the men who shine, they're not going to shine anymore. All the bigness, all the brightness, all self glory is coming down. And the Lord is going to appear in Zion's midst. There'll be no new revelation. Folks, there's no new revelation coming. You say radio, we've had radio for 50 years now. We've had millions and millions of sermons on radio and the world is still lost and America's undone. Television, no television is not the answer. That's a part of it, but that's not going to do it. We've had that now for 20 years and still didn't do it. And we've had the best preaching in the history of the world. We have the best churches. We have all the machinery. Oh, no, no, folks. There's only one hope. There's only one hope left, and that's the awesome presence of God. God breaking through everything and coming in His presence to the church. We are going, we, I, I prophesy right here and now we're on the verge of a revival of the actual presence of God. The Holy Spirit's going to open the eyes of his people. He's going to pull the scales from our eyes. And you and I are going to come up against the terrifying presence of God. The earth shook. The heavens dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai was moved at his presence. And the Lord whom ye seek... Folks, you understand that we're so deaf and dumb and blind now we hear this and don't hear it? We have ears to hear and we don't hear. But I've heard it and I believe it. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. He shall come, saith the Lord. And who's going to bear up on the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appear? You know that all the preaching of gain is godliness is going to melt in his presence. All the pride of success, all the secret hidden sin is going to melt like wax before the presence of God. The Bible said this wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. For he is the refiner's fire. He shall sit as refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. The first thing he's going to do, folks, when he appears in his church again, he's going to work on the ministry first. He's going to sit as refiner of fire, and he's going to purge Levi. This is the ministry. And folks, I tell you, the day is coming. Whether we want it or not, he said, I'll manifest myself to those who weren't even seeking after my name. And God said, I'm going to remove out of my place and I'm suddenly coming to my church. And oh, he's going to come in a melting power. Who's going to stand on that day? Who's going to glorify himself on that day? Who's going to talk about the church he built or the ministry he's established? I don't care if you pastor the biggest church in the world. It's not going to mean a thing in the sight of God. Doesn't matter. All idolatry is going to come down. For behold, the Lord shall come forth out of his place. And he will come down. He will tread upon the high place of the earth. And the mountains shall be molten under him. And the valleys shall be cliffed as wax before the fire. Isaiah said, oh, that he would rend the heavens, that you'd come down, that the mountains might flow away at your presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the water to boil, to make thy name known to the adversaries that the nation may tremble at his presence. 
Jeremiah cried, Will you not fear the Lord? Will you not tremble in his presence? God said to Ezekiel, And all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and every wall shall come tumbling to the ground. <laughs> every wall coming down. Listen, if the ungodly are going to shake and tremble in his holy presence, how is anyone going to stand in the presence of God in his house? How are you and I going to stand when he appears? He said every wall is going to fall to the ground. Down comes all the boasting, all the books and teaching on success. Down comes all the idols of self, down with self-promotion, down with merchandising the gospel, down with all the thieves that are trading in God's house. His house will be a house of prayer, no longer a den of iniquity, no more seeking after the things of this world, no more squandering your faith on temporal things, no more trying to make a name for yourself because judgment's going to begin in his house. His presence is going to frighten and melt everything in sight. He's going to humble his servants. No minister will be allowed to boast in his presence. It's going to become fatal. Listen, it's going to become fatal to harbor secret sin. I believe we're going to see many whose flesh is going to be destroyed that their soul may be saved. People are going to die in the house of God once again that no flesh should glory in his presence. You say, how can you preach like that, Brother Dave? Very easy. I've had an experience like Paul had and Peter. I heard my summons a few weeks ago, and he told me in my time of departure, and at that moment I renounced the world and everything that's in it, and from that moment I knew what he said when he said, Many, many shall come on that day and saying, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils? Have we not healed the sick in your name? And he'll say, I never even knew you. And the other side of that coin is, you never knew me. Do you understand that? Not a few, but many, many, many who have built churches who have had ministries around the world, and they were so busy they didn't take time to know him. And it suddenly dawned on me, if I have my summons, there's only one thing left in this world that matters, and that's to really know him. To know him because you and I have to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that, folks? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account. And God's made it so clear to me he's interested more in winning all of me than he is in my winning all the world for him. Until he has all of me, I don't know him. And I tell you, the time is coming soon that God is going to break through in our midst. Preachers are going to get up and confess their sins publicly. I've already seen it happen. I received a call, the revival just broke out in Chicago, it's happening there, it's happening in California, and day is coming, you will not be able to stand in the presence of the Lord. You will fall on your face and you will confess your sins and no flesh will glory in his presence. You're going to have to flee like Jonah from the presence of the Lord. You won't hold your secret sin any longer. How many times has the Holy Spirit dealt with you? How many times did he say, lay it down? And the only reason you still flirt with it because you have not yet come into his awesome presence. I hear people say, oh, the Lord is moving in our midst. We have seen and felt the presence of God. Folks, you and I don't know what we're talking about. We don't know what we're talking about. If God was really in our midst tonight, I would be the first one down on my face. I couldn't preach. Every man behind me would be on his knees saying, God, I am nothing. I have nothing. I'm nothing. 
None of us could stand in this house. No one could go another minute without confessing, lifting his hands, crying out to God, your head wouldn't be in the air, it would be in the dust. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, and two he covered his feet. Do you understand that the seraphims couldn't even stand to look, so they covered their eyes. They were so ashamed of themselves, they covered their bodies. They didn't want him to look, and they couldn't stand to look in his face. With twain they covered their eyes, and with twain they covered their bodies. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And the message is, see the Lord and die. See the Lord and die. All success, all self-esteem, all secret sin, it's all going to vanish in his presence. It's going to turn to corruption. Daniel said, I lifted up my eyes and I looked and behold a certain man was there clothed in linen and his loins were girded with fine gold. His body was like burl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were lamps of fire. And his arms and his feet like in color to brass, polished brass. And the voice of his words were like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision. But a great quaking fell upon them, so they fled and hid themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and I saw this vision. There remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned to corruption. I retained no strength in me. Yet I heard the voice of his words. When I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, with my face toward the ground. And when he had spoken these words to me, I set my face upon the ground and I became dumb. Couldn't say a word. When the presence of God comes in his house, people are going to stand and confess or they're going to melt and harden themselves. We're going to cry, woe is me. I'm not a success. I'm not a winner. I'm undone. I'm Jacob's worm. I'm a proud man. I'm a proud woman. I know nothing. I have nothing. But for his blood, I'm damned. But for his grace, I'm damned. And then you'll learn to cry out with Paul. He's chosen the weak things of the world, the foolish, the nothings that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now finally, the Redeemer's coming to Zion to prepare his bride for the wedding. To prepare his bride for the wedding. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and the infants that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of the closet. Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. For his wife hath made herself ready. She's arrayed in white and fine linen and righteousness. People, let me tell you what the real gospel is. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is this. Put on righteousness. Lay aside every weight and the sin that easily besets you. Don't become entangled with the things of this world. Go forth now to meet him. Get your lamps burning. Get your oil supplied. Don't set your affection on things below, but on things above. Don't lay up treasures anymore here on earth. That's the gospel. I'll tell you why the Redeemer has to come to Zion with his presence, because the church is not ready to meet him. We're not ready. There's too much hay, wooden stubble. There's 
going to burn. God made this so real to me. He's been speaking to me night after night, saying to my heart, I've got to come back to Zion. I've got to have people face my presence now, lest there be no hope for them when they stand there. Because, folks, if we don't allow the fire of his presence to burn out the dross, if we don't allow him to burn out the sin and the pride now, how do you stand before him? I had a beautiful, last week, a beautiful six-hour experience in the Spirit. When he laid me down and said, come, the Spirit said, come. And I found myself racing through the universe past the stars in an outer darkness, but there was no fear because I was racing further and further out into eternity. And suddenly the world was so small, there was nothing left. It was nothing but a speck out there in space. And the further out I got toward his presence, away from the world and all of its beggarly elements, the more I was crying, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I have nothing, I've done nothing. I could feel the utter nothingness, the emptiness, and I could say, it's only grace, it's only mercy. That's all I have, grace and mercy. And that's when the Lord said, David, there's something more important than your ministry even, more than your family and everything else, and that's to know me. To know me! We have to have this presence of Christ revealed to us now before we go to judgment, and we cannot stand there. What's it going to be like to stand before the judgment seat? It's a private chamber as far as I'm concerned. Forget the masses this time. You can put them at the great white throne. And just he said, I stand one at a time at the door of your heart and I knock. You're going to wait outside his chamber, Christian. And he said, some of us are going to suffer loss. Do you remember when Satan took Jesus to the mountaintop and showed him in an instant all the powers of this world? He said, you can have it in an instant there before his throne. And you'll know as soon as you enter that presence and he opens that door and you're ushered in and there's nothing there in that chamber but the judge, Jesus Christ, the judge whose eyes are a flame of fire and you suspended in space. Nothing, no place to stand. Nothing but His grace and His mercy. And He shows you all you've done. And in a moment of time, He builds your world again. And He shows you your motives. And He said, see, you said to my glory. But it was to your pride. You built your empire. And not my kingdom. Every secret sin, all that was confessed, but still holding, clinging on, besetting you, vexing you. And that's going to be the greatest revelation of grace that you could ever receive. And how many, many thousands in the church of Jesus Christ and even ministers, because that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination at times to the Lord. Some of the greatest known men on this earth are going to stand there naked with nothing, nothing, nothing. They're going to be stripped naked. And they're only going to say, mercy, Jesus, mercy. Oh, you'll get his grace, but you won't get his glory. I want more than grace. I want the glory. Jesus said that they may see my glory which the Father has given to me. Folks, he's going to manifest his glory. We're going to glow, go to glory with glory in our hearts. The glory is coming back to his church. And when that glory appears, remember what Jesus said to, to Mary. He said, didn't I say to you, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Folks, do you want to spend your faith on something worthwhile? He said, didn't I tell you, if you'd believe, if you had faith, you'd see what material blessing know the glory. That's where I'm going to spend my faith. God said, you're going to see my glory. You're going to see my glory. I've already touched 
I've already felt it. Do you understand that your cars that you drive 20 years from now, so Jesus' chair going to be on a heap somewhere, just rusting away? Do you know that your house and everything you own is going to melt? Do you know the only thing that you have now that's worth anything is the knowledge of your saving love and grace? That you and I have nothing more to give to Him but our love. I will glorify the house of my glory. Arise and shine, Zion, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is upon you now, and that glory shall be seen upon thee. That glory shall be seen upon you. All people are going to see it. What was that glory that Mary and Martha saw? What was the glory? It was resurrection power. They saw a man come out of a tomb. Folks, after all these years, he's finally seen fit to show me what his resurrection power means. I'm not talking just about that day that he's going to come for us and take us out of the grave. Oh no, folks, I'm talking about resurrection power right now. I'm talking about being raised from the death of self and pride. I'm talking about being transformed into the kingdom of God where your soul is possessed with Jesus, where you want nothing more in your life than to truly know you are glorifying His name, that every word you say and everything you do is pointing to His majesty and His glory. We need a resurrection, a revelation of His resurrection power in the church right now. I've canceled all my meetings. I felt led of God to take this one. I've got next week three more and that's it. And for the next five months, I've got a little prayer chamber and I'm going to wait because I'm repenting. And I'm falling on my knees. And I'm saying, oh God, how many times you've come to me and said, now, make your move. Go all the way. Humble yourself and seek my face. And how many times we go so close and then we quit and we say some other time. And I'm so grieved at what I've seen around the country and around the world. I've preached in some of the largest Assembly of God and Pentecostal churches in the world in the past six months. One pastor of a large church told me he hadn't prayed in one year. He has devotions every day, but he doesn't pray. We've got men so busy running around the world trying to win the kingdom for God. But where are those? Where are those who shut themselves in and hear that sound of the trumpet? You understand, people, you and I are not ready. You're not ready. Now, folks, I can say some things now because I've got nothing left to lose. I've got nothing to prove to anybody. I've already been given my divine detachment. We're here now in His unbelievable presence. And I'm going to bring you what I feel the Holy Spirit told me to tell you. And this is the reason I came. Maybe you're not relating to everything I'm saying yet. The first of the Pentecostal Summers of God in Canada. If all the leaders and all the pastors and all the people, lest you and I repent, he's going to remove your candlestick. He's going to remove it. And you pick him up a people who are given totally to his love. You put away your professionalism. You get back to the cross. You get back to the secret closet. You humble yourself. You go back to the meekness that you once knew. 
you go back to the sense of his sovereignty saying not my will anymore but yours I've got a neighbor who got his summons two weeks ago well known young singer in America Keith Green he lives next door to me his plane came down 12 people killed 27 years old I talked to Melody his wife the other day she said got on the plane and said, honey, if I don't come back, raise Daniel for the Lord. And suddenly, he goes up. Fifteen seconds later, he's down. The plane burst in flames. The bodies dissolved. Couldn't even identify the bodies. <laughs> oh, folks, we live like we're never going to die. There's some pastors here tonight that need to repent. In just a few moments, he's going to move closer. He promised me that he'd give us just a little taste of his presence. He's going to appear among us. He's not going to let you sit in your seat comfortable anymore. He's going to bring you back. In the moment you feel His Spirit breathe on you. Humble yourself. Just come and stand in His presence. Say, Jesus. I want to know you. He's going to tell you, you did so much in my name, but you didn't take time to know me. You didn't take time. You so busy, you didn't take time. You became a stranger to me. You used my name, but you didn't know me. I don't care whether you think I'm a mystic or not. Because I'm just as much at home over there as I am here tonight. I've already seen his face. I don't want anything this world has to offer. Oh, I'm going to occupy till he comes for me. I'm going to work. But you understand that you haven't been given any more time. You've only been given the hour that you're in right now. You don't have a promise of getting out of this building. Every one of you could be summoned tonight. Now you think about that. If I only had four or five more hours to live, when I go into the judgment chamber, and I appear before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, I'm going to stand. He said that you may be presented faultless with exceeding great joy. That's what He wants. The Lord wants on that day to reach out and say, Come on, my child. Come on closer. I know you. You know me. We are one. Come, my brother. Come, my sister, into my presence. Folks, that's what I want. I want Him to embrace me on that great day. I want to be embraced by the Savior Himself. I want Him to reach out of that judgment seat and say, David, come closer. My son, come closer. Because he said, you're going to be known even as you know. What you're doing right now depends, oh, it depends on what it's going to be like on that day. You're going to be known as you're known right now. Are you close to him? Do you know him? Are your sins really forgiven? Have you forsaken? Have you repented? Are you looking for his coming? Have you set your affections on things above? Are you still so earthbound? So interested in yourself and your ministry? In what you're doing? Oh, Lord Jesus, come. Exalt yourself. Let the presence of all...
Thank you, choir, orchestra, and welcome to all of our visitors. We trust you are sensing the manifest presence of Jesus here this morning. As you, as you heard, we just got back from Israel. We went there to dedicate, first of all, a church that uh, on Mount Carmel where Elijah uh, called fire down out of heaven, and I'm happy to announce to you the fire is still coming down out of heaven on Mount Carmel. We had two services, by the way, for those who prayed. You know, uh, this church knows that I don't like to fly. I'm one of those white knuckle flyers, but uh, we had. It was just like a dream, just like a pillow flight all the way there and back. So thanks for your prayers. <laughs> and uh, we had two services on uh, Saturday. Dedication. This church uh, is comprised of Arabs and Jews worshiping together. Had to have two services to, two services to accommodate the crowds. There were probably 800 in each service. The church seats about uh, 800 like with the overflow about 800 and uh, they they have 12 stones around representing the 12 stones that Elijah uh, built an altar with and the spirit of the Lord was there mightily uh, and an unusual experience in one of the services I think it was the first service you know Israel has two rains the former and latter the early and the spring rain and the fall rain <clears throat> They hadn't had rain in five months, and it's still two months yet before the rains come. I, I was preaching on judgment that's coming to America. And as soon as I said judgment is coming to America, there was a lightning bolt and a thunder that shook the building, and the rain fell, absolutely fell, on Mount Carmel. And the people were just praising the Lord, and I didn't know what was going on and, and until I find later that they hadn't had a drop of rain in all this time, and there was this one clap of thunder, and it seemed that God was putting an exclamation mark on what his servant was saying from the pulpit. I'll tell you, it left a mark. It left a mark on me, and uh, it was it was an incredible experience. And uh, we bring you greetings from David and Karen, uh, David the pastor. To you who don't know was a, an actor here in the city. And uh, in fact, he, he, was, he was in a play right in this building. The Lord marvelously saved him, married a Jewish wife, and, and uh, there are pastors of that church sent out from this church. Our ministry, World Challenge in Texas, <clears throat> my international ministry of people from all over the country that our mending list uh, helped us. And this church and other 39 nations helped. Most of the finances uh, came from this church and from World Challenge. And we're very thrilled. Remember when we came and we started this, God started this church, we said we wanted to honor Israel. And by honoring Israel, God would honor us. And he has. We were going to have communion every, every, month, every week. We were going to honor Israel. And because we honored Israel, he gave us the privilege uh, to build that church right on Mount Carmel. Then we had a, a conference in Jerusalem on Sunday uh, that came from everywhere there. And I just felt that I had to prophesy and I preached a very, had to preach a very hard message because in Israel, there are... Uh, there are two kinds of Jews. There are religious Jews and there are secular Jews. The religious Jews are in a minority. The majority are secular who don't even believe in God. The cab drivers, God, where was he during the Holocaust? If there was a God, Jesus, he may be okay, but God, where was he? And, uh, and you know, on the mosque there, the big mosque, the Muslim mosque, uh, there's, there's a great big lettering up there that says, God had no son. God had no son. And uh, <clears throat> the, the Spirit of the Lord came down, by the way, on the second service in, uh, on Mount Carmel. The Holy Spirit came upon me to ask. There, there was such a sense of hopelessness in so many people. I said, how many of you have been con contemplating suicide? Fifteen people came forward that 
were contemplating suicide. And I thank God for his faithfulness. And, and uh, the, the Lord also touched many, many hearts in Jerusalem. I want to <clears throat> go now into the message. As you know, I've been busy <clears throat> finishing another book. The first book that went out across the United States is up to around 300,000 have gone and it's just now beginning to go to bookstores all over the country. And it's had quite an impact. It was called America, it's called America's Last Call uh, on the Brink of a Financial Holocaust. And uh, this new book is called, is entitled God's Plan to Keep His People in the Coming Depression. This is the 10th message I will have preached on that subject. There's one more next week, God willing, and then the book is finished. And you people have had, I'm, I've been testing these messages on you. I've been giving them to you first, and then uh, next month this goes to print. And it, uh, we've been having a demand for it. It's going to go into about 40 languages immediately. And we're going to <clears throat> share with you the 10th of that. And you may not understand the first fifth, how my message title fits the first 15 minutes of this, 10, 15 minutes of the message, but you'll see it as we go along, entitled, A Craving for the Presence of the Lord, A Craving for the Presence of the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, you must come upon me now with your anointing and your touch. There's no man that can speak this prophetic word in his own strength and power. Lord, we are in a time that frightens our flesh. And in the natural, we can't receive these things. There has to be a work of the Holy Spirit in us to receive them. Now, Father, I come here now just to deliver your mind, that which you've put in my heart at the throne of our everlasting God. Lord, this is a time for us to hear and understand and know what you are about to do. You will not keep your people in ignorance or in darkness. And we are asking you now, Lord, to encourage our hearts by the word, and you will, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, you've heard me refer quite often uh, in the past uh, few months about the coming storm in the United States and America, an economic storm. I started warning that almost six months before the Asian collapse a year and a half ago, and uh, then it broke over not only Asia, but Russia. And few people want to hear it, I noticed. Even when I was in Israel, and, and they'd say, what do you think is coming? And we hear what you're saying. And after about five minutes, you could see they, they just wanted to change the subject. I, I was with an attorney friend the other day, and, and he said, Reverend Wilkerson, he said, I know a storm is coming. I know something unusual. You can feel it. You feel it in Wall Street. You feel it everywhere. Something incredible is about to happen. But he said, I really don't want to hear it. He said, I just kind of hope it'll go away. You see, what I'm preaching to you is very tame to what the secularists are preaching now. And the warning that's coming from economic export, uh, experts here in the United States and even around the world. I've been warning of a, a ruinous storm that's coming to the United States and to the whole world. But listen to what a secular economist said this past month. He said, if, if there were an economics channel on TV, like a weather channel, that be frenetic newscasters would be interrupting regular programs right now and give us an hourly update on something that they would be calling the storm of the century an economic cataclysm as big or bigger than the Great Depression of the 30s. But if God, God forbid, if it reaches the United States, watch out. Stock prices could easily fall two-thirds, 6,000 points on the Dow, and it could take a decade or more to recover. He said, this storm that's coming is chilling. That's a secular writer. Now, when I say something like that, even ministers' conference is taken, uh, it's, it's considered some kind of theological uh, aberration. It's considered just my opinion, and even Pentecostal ministers don't want to hear it much anymore. This writer, though, goes on to paint a picture of an economic meltdown that could wipe out investors, and it could even wipe out mutual funds 
some mutual funds entirely, absolutely wipe out mutual funds. Now, I've been saying and prophesying that the market would go down 5,000 points, and then I picked up this uh, writer's note, and he says 6,000. They go beyond what we are saying. <clears throat> now, beloved, like it or not, whether we want to hear it or not, and you might want to shut it out of mind and say, Pastor, move on. Now, I, I tell you, you come this afternoon, you come this evening, you're going to hear uh, you're going to hear encouraging words. You're going to hear about communion with Christ. You're going, to talk, you're going to hear about growth. You're going to be encouraged and all these things. My role as a watchman is to, 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 to warn his body. I have to do what I'm called to do. So, uh, and God balances that by bringing other messages. And, and one time soon, believe it or not, soon he'll let me get into that stream. In October the 24th, 1929, the day the stock market broke and ushered in the Great Depression, a writer called Elliot Bell, who was there on Wall Street when it happened. I was down the other day walking on Wall Street after I got back from Israel. In fact, I think it was Thursday. I, was, I went down to Wall Street just to feel, and I had some business there, and it was incredible, the feeling there that there's something in the air. And he writes these words, and this was October 24th, 1929, the day the market broke. He said, it was the most terrifying, unreal day I've ever seen on Wall Street. He said it began with a cool, on a cool overcast day. It was about 50 degrees. The wind was blowing softly through the canyons of Wall Street, the temperature in the 50s. Bankers and brokers were buttoning up their coats on the way to the exchange. But about 11 o'clock, <clears throat> a storm broke. I've been telling you about a storm. They use these terms. A storm broke, a deluge. It came with such a ferocity that left everybody on Wall Street dazed. The bottom just fell out of the market for no reason. Wall Street became a nightmare spectacle. Traders who just a few short days before luxuriated in delusions of wealth saw all their hopes smashed and collapsed in a devastating storm. So far beyond their wildest fears, it was almost unreal. The storm created a sense of danger like men trying to hold on to a sinking ship. He said the sense of danger. I felt it the other day when I was there. Folks, we no longer, I'm no longer saying a storm is coming. I'm telling you it's already overhead. It's here. <clears throat> now, you, you could say, Pastor, what does all of that have to do with your title? thought you were here to encourage us. A craving for the presence of the Lord. Folks, it has to do with everything about our spiritual condition when the storm comes, how we respond, how we as Christians react when we are facing a change in lifestyles that will never again be like they are now. How does that affect us? All of this news that we hear, all of these things that we may not want to hear, but we know intuitively that it's going to happen. How are we going to react? And folks, when I look into the future and I see these black clouds and I hear the thunder peeling already and the lightning, I, I, and I have a sense in me that everything the prophets have prophesied, all, every prophet in the Old the New Testament, everything they've said is about to be fulfilled. And as a Christian spirit filled, you, you, if you're walking in the spirit, you have got to sense it also. It's a revelation of the Holy Spirit that everything is winding up and we are coming now to midnight. There's a sense that every prophecy is being fulfilled. Everything we've preached about for years, everything we've talked about in this book is now coming down upon us. The ends of all things have come upon us. And we are there, folks. We are there. And then when I see this and I feel it in the spirit, then I know that every foolish, frivolous thing in my life has to go out the window. When I sense by the Spirit, and he begins to speak so strongly, not just through your pastor here, but through many, many, even secularists, then I know that every ungodly ambition has to end. 
Every covetous desire has to go. Every root of bitterness, every selfish dream, every attachment to the things of this world, everything that's corrupted or hindered a blessed communion with Jesus, it all has to go. Things have to change. It can't be life as usual. There has to be something we do. There has to be a change in our walk with God. When I hear and see the shaking, and God said, you're going to shake everything that could be shaken. And when I see fear and panic coming upon nations, and, and I see this global superpower about to be uh, shamed, and its economy smashed before the whole world, by the way, we already are the laughing stock of the world. And while the world is crumbling all around us, the whole nation is absorbed in some sexual debauchery in the White House. It's incomprehensible to the world. Pick up the paper in Israel and you see the picture of the president with the nose of Pinocchio. Liar, liar. And everybody is laughing. America is the laughing stock of the world right now. It's part of the judgment of Almighty God. When I look about now and I see this shaking, then you have to come to the question, what is going to be the most important thing in your life in this time? What's going to be the most important thing, folks? You're not going to be thinking by psychosis then. You're not going to be thinking about your psychi psychiatrist in the couch. You're not going to be thinking about whether you like your job or whether you're fulfilled in your job. No, it's all going to boil down to, to some very, very simple questions. What are the most important issues now? I found my answer in Israel. When I was in Israel, I asked my host, David, to take me to a lonely spot way up on top. They call it Carmel, up in Mount Carmel. And I said, just drop me off. And I gave him a, a time hours later. I said, come pick me up. And I, I was suddenly out overlooking the valley where Elijah outran into Jezreel for 26 miles, outran Ahab, King Ahab's chariot. And I'm looking down at that valley. I said, somewhere there was a dusty road there, and he ran. It takes, it takes 30 minutes to get there by car. Can you imagine what it took for him? And, and I'm, I'm saying somewhere, not far from where I am, praying right now the prophet called Elijah built an altar and called fire out of heaven and 400 prophets were slain and their blood is on this land somewhere and, and uh, how they got uh, how they got all those barrels of water in a famine I don't know and up on that mountain how they got them there I don't know but those things are very real but I was I was I was expecting some kind of historical sense to hit me some great release in prayer uh, that, 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 boy, I'm in Israel. I'm right where the prophet stood, and I, I am praying where Elijah prayed. And God said, He's a man of like passions, and I can pray just like him. And then I look to, 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 to the east, and there's the Mediterranean overlooking Haifa. And I said, That little cloud came right over the probably was now the port of Haifa. I said, Lord, that cloud was right there. The rain fell right here, and I waited for it to hit me, and nothing hit me. Uh, it, it may have had something to do with the, the Coke cans and the McDonald wrappers uh, all over the ground. I don't know. It could have been the car over there where two kids were making out, I, you know, on Mount Carmel. It had nothing hit me after hours. Now, I had a wonderful time with the Lord, but there was no sense. There, there was something almost of, wait a minute, I, I, I'm feeling a little lonely here. We went to the tomb. And there's the Hill of the Skull. And I, I was there after the Six-Day War years ago, and it wasn't commercialized. But now it, it's T-shirt country. But, but I, 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 I walk in the tomb, and I'm, I thought, well, maybe in the tomb I'll feel that sense. I remember when I was there the first time, I came home feeling the same way. And I said, Lord, what's wrong? He said, well, it's more important that I walk where you walk rather than you walk where I walked. I want to walk with you where you walk. And I never forgot that. But, you know, uh, even the Garden of Gethsemane, I don't know whether it was all the commercialism around there or, or, or what, but there was no sense of a release in prayer. 
Nothing hit me. In fact, I had some wonderful times in prayer. I, 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 I didn't go to sightsee, and, and, and uh, I was there when Gwen got on a camel <laughs> and screamed, ah, when that thing went up. But I had some wonderful times in prayer. I mean, pouring my heart out to the Lord, but it, it didn't hit me till I got on the plane and 30,000 feet over the Atlantic. And in a sense, I'm, I'm going to a place. And I was feeling the drawing of that. I wasn't going just to where we live. I was going to a place in the house where we live. I was going to a room. You see... It's my craving room. It's my Gethsemane. It's my Mount Carmel. It's a place where I go to vent my longings and my cravings for him. It's a trysting spot that's known only to me. You see, Elijah probably went up there many times to pray. Jesus uh, uh, went many times into the garden to pray. It was a special place. And every prophet in the Bible had that special place. And Jesus, I know, had a special place. And he went up to mountains to pray. And when I got off the plane, the first chance I had after getting rid of jet lag, I went into that room and I shut the door and I raised my hands. I began to weep. And I said, Jesus, I have missed you so. I've been so hungry to get back in this room. Because you see, the word crave means to long, to earnestly desire, to go after, to pursue. It's it's a the craving room, as I describe it, is is some place where I go not to get prayers answered, though I ask him and I lay before him all those things. It's a place where I love him, a place where I'm drawn nigh to him. It's a place where I I I embrace him and he embraces me there's a craving and that craving gets stronger and stronger is every time I go into that room I've come to the following conclusions and I want you to listen very closely I I am first of all fully convinced that God's going to miraculously protect and provide for his people in the difficult times that are ahead. That's beyond question. He said, the Bible says, Jesus said, I know what you need before you ask. That's enough for me. He knows what we're going to need. He said, and and I'm an earthly father. I've got uh, five children and 11 grandchildren. And if I were a rich man, like my heavenly father is, and I had all the resources, and I saw one of my children suffering, I would take care of them. How much more, he said, if you earthly know how to do that, how much more will your heavenly father? So it's beyond question that God's going to provide. He's going to provide food and water and shelter. He's not going to feed you filet mignon, but he is going to give you all the rice and beans you need, anything that is practical. He's going to give supernatural guidance and direction on how to prepare if you're in business and you're, and you're in love with Jesus and you believe uh, that he said he knows what you need, you seek him and he'll give you direction in your business. He'll give you direction in your family and in your home. But listen closely, please. Having a long-term miraculous supply of every need being met can become a damning experience. Let me run it by you again. Having all your needs miraculously supplied over a long period of time, miraculously, can become a damning experience. Now consider the children of Israel in that desolate wilderness. Forty long years God provided for them. You know their tents never deteriorated. No, no tears. They moved and moved. Not a single tear. No deterioration. Rain didn't come through. He covered Folks, you, if you want to know heat, you go into some of those uh, Judean hills and the valleys at 105. And, 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 and uh, especially if you're near the Mediterranean and the oppressive heat and the oppressive, uh, what do you call it, uh, humidity. Do you understand the miracle of that cloud that God sent miraculously to cover them? Or they would have died under that oppressive heat, especially from noon to three o'clock. 
Their clothes never wore out. Their turbans never wore out. Their, their sandals never wore out. Now, surely, I'm not saying that God expanded them when you grew up. I think they traded around, but those, God, they never wore out. No, I believe God can cause shoes to grow. If you've heard it said, somebody said all day, God didn't open, they didn't go through the Red Sea. The Red Sea at that time was, it was only three feet deep and they walked through. And he said, well, it's a greater miracle that God could destroy a whole army in three feet of water. <laughs> These people ate angels food. Nobody was employed. Total unemployment. <laughs> and you're worried about your job. Total unemployment. And God took care of every single need in their hard times. God did everything for them that we hope he'll do for us today in our hard times. He did it. He doesn't have to prove it over again. He did it. He's going to do it. They were preserved and protected miraculously while all the nations around them were in turmoil. Egypt was in ruins. Egypt was devastated. There was no food. Remember, God had devastated Egypt, and here they are, devastation all around them, all around the nations being devastated, and here they are, food, water, protection, and, and, and they're, they're surviving very well while everything is in ruins around them. But they got bored. They murmured. They complained. Even while they enjoyed the miracle blessings of God. Now, folks, this, this, this has got to be absorbed now before these things come. Because here we sit in Times Square Church in all of this wonderful splendor. September the 20th, 1998, the American stock market is trembling. Asia is falling into depression. Japan is on the brink. The president of Sony again said that they are going into total depression. And now Korea, Russia... Brazil is next, followed by Argentina, Latin America, and then Mexico. They're all going down, and soon Brazil is going to devalue its currency. Argentina has to do it, and finally Mexico will do it. And folks, that is where our banks are so vulnerable here in the United States and our entire uh, Wall Street structure. <clears throat> But in the midst of all this frightful news that I've been telling you about, here I come and I, I give you this good news. Folks, isn't it good news God's going to take care of his people? Isn't that wonderful news? It's absolutely wonderful that God is going to take loving care of us in this time, in this age, just as he did in that time of that age. But let me give you this warning, please. Even though I believe God wants us to do our part, and, pre and prepare, and, and I'll tell you now that we're meeting next week with our pastors and elders to pray about what we should share with you on how to prepare, physically prepare uh, for what is coming. But I want to tell you, you can have a 10-year supply of rice and beans. You, you can have acreage out in the country somewhere, and you've got your own generator, your own well. In fact, you have got it all down. All the survivalists have told you how to prepare for the coming crisis of the Depression, and you've got everything like the rich man who sat there and said, I am set for life. You can have it all and be the most bored, confused person in the world because you missed the point. You had the wrong focus. You wanted God's provision and not his presence. I'm telling you, if personal security becomes the focus, then we're going to end up like the children of Israel about after... Now, you Puerto Ricans may not believe this, but you get tired of rice and beans after a certain amount of time. Forgive me, I'm sorry. You see, if all you're trying to do is survive an economic depression or a chaos, 
What point is it if you have everything and you sit there through that bored, murmuring, complaining, looking back to the good life? You don't have the presence of the Lord in you or with you. And you're growing more and more bitter and sour, even though sitting there while everybody around you is is suffering and you're sitting there in the lap of the good things. Those good things will make you bored and restless and empty without the presence of the Lord. Jesus said, is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? And what he's saying, don't focus on, he he said, don't say what shall we eat and what shall we drink or what shall we wear. But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be taken care of. They'll be added unto you. The Lord says, no, it's not about security. It's about your relationship with me. He's saying, don't focus on that. If you will focus on my presence in your life, if you will deal with sin in your life, if you will seek me with everything that's in you, I'll take care of you. You take care of your heart, I'll take care of your basket. There's nobody in this world now that convinced me that America's going to miss having a full-blown depression. Nobody in the world, because the Holy Ghost has convinced me. I am totally convinced. I don't get this just from reading books and economists' uh, amusings. More than that, it's something clear from the Word of God and things that we know. And I don't care if the stock market bounces back to 15,000 points and be the biggest fool's market in the world's history. And the higher it goes, the worse will be the fall. But Moses knew well that without the presence of the Lord with them, not he or the nation could make it through the perilous times that had befallen them. Moses knew that he had to have more than a legal contract with God. Now, I want you to follow closely. Remember that the setting here is that Israel had corrupted themselves by worshiping a golden idol, and the whole nation had risen up to eat and drink and play before this idol in nakedness and shame. And God was angered by this blatant idolatry. And he said, my wrath is wax and hot against them. He said to Moses, I'm going to consume them. And you know that Moses prevailed with God and God had mercy on them and he spared Israel, but on one awful condition. He said, all right, I'm going to let you go up to the land of milk and honey. You go on. I'm going to, I'm going to take care of your enemies. I'll send hornets before you. I'll, I, in fact, am going to send an angel with you to lead you on. But he said, I'm not going with you. I'm not going, my presence will no longer be in your midst. I am leaving the camp. Moses cried out to God. Well, here's here's, here's what the scripture said. Go on your way. I will not go with you. I will send an angel to go before thee, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. Moses takes his tent outside the camp. His own tent takes it outside the camp far away to begin to intercede before God. And this is his prayer. He said, oh, God, this people have sinned a great sin and have made Gods of gold. Now, I want you to look at this. He separated this two. There are are two evils here. One evil, the result of the first. He he said, they they have committed a great sin. And this is another sin. They have built a golden idol. In fact, this building the golden idol was a result of this great sin of Israel. It's the sin of today, just as it was the sin then. What is this incredible, awful sin that Israel committed that Moses is crying out and said, Oh, Lord, we have committed a great sin against you. That great sin of then and today is a lack of respect for the presence of the Lord in our personal lives. It's a lack of respect, a lack of desire for the presence of the Lord in our lives, lightly esteeming the presence of the Lord, not having a craving in the heart to honor and preserve his presence in our life. It is to want his provision, to want his protection, and to not crave after his presence, the very presence that makes the provisions possible.
I'm telling you sadly, and I see something, and it really hit me this past week. Now, I want every one of you here today that call yourself a Christian, you say, I, I am a Christian. I'm a believer. Somewhere along the line, you heard a pastor, minister, somebody testified to you about the word of God and said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Reach into your heart and get a hold of faith. Lay hold of that promise and believe that Jesus died for your sins. Finish the work. You claim it. It's a legal contract. It's a covenant God has made with you. Believe and thou shalt be saved. And you did that and rightly so. And that's fine. You are legally saved. You are under contract. You've been brought into the family of God. But if all you have is a legal contract and a legal covenant with God, you've missed the point. It will never lead you to holiness. It will never lead you to desire. You will never know him in his fullness because you are standing on a legal contract. What the Bible says, this, I claim it. But where's the affection? Where is the love? Where is that craving in your heart? Where is that love? The Bible said you are now a son of God. But where is that love a son should have a father who adopted him? Where is it? I don't see it in the land. I, 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 I picked up a, a sermon, a written sermon. Or someone gave it to me from uh, inter, the internet. And it's a powerful, brilliant sermon by a man I know. A man, a preacher who smokes and drinks. And every time you see him in a restaurant, he's surrounded with beautiful actresses. A, a, a lawlessness. And what a sermon. He says, reach down into your gut. Pull up some faith. Lay a hold of the promise of the finished work of Christ. And don't ever let anybody shake you. But it's all legal. There is no love. There is no devotion. There is no crying out to God. There's no desire for the holiness of God. Because anyone who's shut in with God and craving his presence, that holy presence in his life will conform you to the image of Christ. God offered Moses and Israel this legal deal. He said, I promise to send an angel before you. I'll take care of you. I'll defeat all your enemies. I'll give you a land of milk and honey. Now that's saying, I'll give you salvation. I'll bless you. I'll take care of you. And it's all legal. It's a legal deal. It's a covenant. God made it. And he made it to a stiff-necked people that hadn't changed. That still had no hunger and thirst after him he out of sheer mercy and that's what it is salvation is absolute mercy the mercy of God came and found you and you have a legal contract I'm a son of God the Bible says that that settles it and so many go on their stiff necked way neglecting him they don't pray they don't seek the face of God there's no love there's no devotion and all the time God had said to Israel, I'm bringing you out of Egypt. I'll break your bondage, but I want you to love me with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength. This was a love affair. And here's an offer of a legal deal. God says, I have given you my binding promises. And you know, that's, that's, that's all some people want. Now, I know I'm not going to hell. I've been saved. And there are some people believe that they're saved and they can live like the devil and still go to heaven. What a surprise awaits those poor blinded souls. You see, the stiff necked people had no desire to get to know him or to embrace him. And now you and I have two testaments, the old and the new, filled with legal promises that are yea and amen to everyone who believes. Yes, they are. He will keep his word. He will feed you. He will clothe you. He will house you. He will make sure that the enemies don't prevail over you. He's not going to keep you rich, but he'll keep you supplied.
Now, you can go on with that legal deal. You can go on with that. He'll keep his word to you. But see, Israel now has for the first time to deal with this issue of God's presence. They'd never dealt with it before. They had just taken everything for granted. They took lightly the presence of the Lord. They saw all of his blessings and provisions and, and got bored under it all and really had no heart for him. But now they've heard the word. God says, you've got your legal deal. Now you go on your own way. I'm not going with you. I'll protect you. I'll supply all your needs. Now, if that's all you want, folks, you can have it. If, you, if all you think, well, well, there's a depression coming, hard times. Uh, I want my legal deal. I want to make sure there's food, every, everything else. That's enough for me. I, I have this settled faith. I've believed. I'm saved. I'm not going to hell. He's going to take care of me. Good. And when the people heard the evil tidings, you know, that the Lord's was, presence was going to leave, they mourned, and no man did put on his ornaments. Now, up to this moment, the men had been strutting around the wilderness, laden down with foolish ornaments. They, they got it from Egypt. Ankle bracelets, arm bracelets, armlet bracelets, trinklets of brass hanging down their neck. Trading around with the old baggage of Egypt. But now the message has come. My presence will not go with you. And so now they take off all of their ornaments. And they begin to mourn. Mourn means to weep and cry and lament. They were crying and weeping and lamenting. Now that's a message many churches don't want to hear. You can go to nine out of ten churches in New York, and if I got up and preached about come to the Lord and mourn for your sins and, and get rid of all the baggage of your past life, half the congregation would think I'm stupid or walk out. You don't want to hear it. Believe. And then God comes. They'd already put off their ornaments. And here's what he said. Now put off your ornaments. They'd already put them off. And he's coming back, put them off now that I may know what to do with you. What he's saying, all right, you put them off temporarily, but leave them off. Don't go back to your old ways. Don't cry and mourn and then go put your ornaments back on. Don't go back to the old sins. Don't go back to your old life, your old way of thinking. Leave it. God, God seems to be saying uh, an unusual thing here. It's almost like God sounds undecided. He said, take off your arms until I decide what I'm, I don't know what to do with you yet. He knew exactly what he was going to do. And he's waiting for something. And he found what he's waiting for in that tent out far from the camp. Because there is Moses. God found the man who is going to give him what he's looking for, what he's been waiting for all of this time. Not some kind of a legal contract. Not just somebody relying on the promises of God and begging and seeking for answers to prayer and having protection for their flesh. God says, I'm after more than that. And he found it in that tent. He found a pastor. He found an associate pastor, Joshua. He found those men on their face before God. And in this perilous times, they, they turned away from all of their activities, every demand on their time. Everything had to go so that they could pour their hearts out before the Lord. And folks, I believe in these perilous times, God is going to raise up a holy remnant, just like these, the Bible said, everyone which sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle, which was outside the camp. This means they made a special effort. They got up every day and they went out where Moses was pleading with God, laying hold of God. I ask you, Christian, do you have that time? I'm not talking about a five-minute devotion. Do you have a craving room anywhere? You have a trysting spot. You have some place where you get alone with the Lord and say, Lord, I want more than this legal deal. I want to know you. I want your presence in my life. I want to feel you. Folks, I go into my craving room and say, Lord, 
I take it by faith. Yes, but I want to feel your presence. I want to feel your love and I want you to feel mine. It's a feeling thing. They're mourning over the sins of the nation. The, the, you know, you hear it say, where's the outrage about what's happening in Washington? Where's the outrage? When the majority of the people say it's okay as long as the economy is good. Where's the outrage? I'll tell you where the outrage is. <laughs> it's right here. These people were mourning for the sins of Israel. Now they're are mourning. It's not where you just get up in, the, up in the pulpit and you scream out again. I could stand and give you a scathing message. I, I, I could rip Washington apart. I've got a, something in my gut and my flesh that would probably want to do it. But that's not the answer. The answer is in a, on your face before God, mourning before him and repenting for the whole nation. Us repenting. The outrage is expressed to the Lord, not to man. And oh, I've, I've expressed, I've been outraged. Yes, I've raised my hands in my craving room and cried out before God and confessed not only my sins, but the sins of the nation. Out of this prayer time came a cry, Lord, if your presence goes not with me, carry us no further. Boy, this is a, this is a powerful statement. He's saying, Lord, unless, you're, unless I can have your presence, unless I have face-to-face intimacy with you, unless I can come to you and know that you are right there, I feel and I know and I sense your presence. Remember the Bible says this man talked face to face with God and he said, I will not lose that. I am not going, I don't care what promises, I don't care what legally it is, I don't care if you send a host of angels. No angel for me. You know, a couple of years ago, they, they were books about angels and you go to the books, they're angels. One, one woman told me, she got in the car and looked back and there was a 12 foot angel in the back. I thought, how can a 12 foot angel get in a six foot car? You know, <laughs> If you want an angel, the Bible said the angel of the Lord camps around about them that fear him. You've got your angel. Go your way satisfied. Eat all the water, all the food. Bored, murmuring, complaining. Whereas you can just say, oh, Jesus, this is not about my surviving. This is about my getting to know you in hard times. This is giving me time to crave and yearn after you and get to know you with everything that's in my heart. And he says to God, Lord, if you're not going to go with me, if your presence is not with me every day I got up and every waking hour, I'm stopping right here. I'm going to die. I have had it. I'm not going another step. You're not going to get a craving for the Lord in these hard times unless you pray for it. It's in that secret closet. It's in that place where you reach out and say, oh, God created me a hunger and thirst after you. God, by his spirit, creates that. It's not, you can't do it in your human flesh. Now, you can hear the word and be convicted, and then you go to prayer and say, oh, God, I want you with everything that's in my heart. Now, here's what he's saying. Lord, thank you for your generous, gracious promise to take care of us thank you for your covenant promises to deal with our enemies thank you for the promise of the angel but Lord we don't want to go that legal path we want to go the love way we want to be devoted to you hallelujah then he knew he knew God would be faithful he knew God would take care of him as he did in the past. But now he's drawing it. Folks, let me close with an illustration. <clears throat> One of the highlights of our visit to Israel was to visit two wonderful sisters of Mary. This is a Lutheran organization, have their headquarters in Darmstadt, Germany. I, I've known them for 40 years. They're wonderful people. Sister Basilia Slink is one of the great saints of this generation. She's 94 years old and still praising Jesus. <laughs> 
as of this time. And these two sisters have been on, on the Mount of Olives. They, they, they have a compound there. They have a, about a three, four-story house there overlooking the old city. And we went to visit. There's two sisters been there 36 years. 36 years of ministering to Arabs and Jews. Saintly. You can feel the presence of the Lord when you walk in. And they served us some tea and cookies. And they, they began to tell us about the war that came. And the Jordanian army came and surrounded and dug trenches all around their compound. And they were screaming and yelling. They were convinced they're going to take Jerusalem. And the, one of the <clears throat> officials came and told the sisters, you better get out. The war is going to break out shortly. There's going to be bombing and strafing, and you're going to be right in the middle. Because the Israeli army is going to come from the, the left and over here to the right. The Jordanians have dug in their trenches and ready. And they prayed. And the Lord gave them a word, the same word he gave to uh, Gideon. I'm going to be with you. Don't be afraid. And the Lord told them to store up food before all this happened. They, in the basement, they had a full storage of food and water and supplies. The war broke out. Israelis came from one side, <coughs> strafing uh, <coughs> bombs, and <coughs> the house was hit. The came right through the roof. The walls collapsed. One wall, one wall remained. One corner of a wall that had a plaque on it. God will keep his people, words of that. God will protect his people. The plaque stood there as a testimony. An another uh, shell came through and broke through two floors, but it didn't break into the basement. And those dear saints, they, they had food. They had water. No bullet could touch them. No bomb could bomb them out. And they were there for 14 days in that basement. One, one almost broke through, but they fell on some, I think it was a pile of carpets or something they had in the corner, fell right on those carpets and didn't do any harm. But they told us the thing that blessed my heart. They said, it wasn't that God, so much. we thank God that he protected us. And he, he provided the food. He told us how to prepare. That was all wonderful. But she said, if all of our years in Israel, those were the most precious hours we've ever spent because Jesus manifested himself in that basement. The presence of Jesus as we've never known. She said, we look back, those were the most precious 14 days of our life in a basement because Jesus so revealed himself and they were, had such craving hearts. They, they, they just wanted more and more and more. And even today, they look back. They are, their work is finished. They leave in November. They go back to Darmstadt after 36 years. But they go back with this precious memory. And folks, they still have craving heart for Jesus. But in the hard times, they look back. They're not thinking food. They're not thinking shelter. Or even protection for the flesh. It was the revelation of the presence of Jesus Christ. Folks, in the days ahead, I've told you this. Pastor Carter's told you this. And I believe with all my heart. We are going to see manifestations of the presence of Jesus as no other generation has seen it. Paul the Apostle would be jealous if he could, he could even be near it. Every prophet in the Old Testament had yearned for it and see it. We are going to see it. You think it's wonderful. Sometimes you come here and the present Lord just comes down and we can't even talk. We sit here for 15 minutes in total silence, just drinking. Wait till the manifestations that you see when you come with a craving heart. And it's only going to, it's only going to be revealed to the craving hearts. You've got to come with a craving heart to yearn after. I'm going to church not to hear Brother Dave or Pastor Carter or any other pastors. I'm not going there to try to get a word that God's going to somehow keep me. I've got a craving heart. I want to get to know Jesus better.
Do you understand any of this? <laughs> I do. It's all about Jesus. It's all about seeking him first, giving him everything in your life. Check your devotion. Are you just satisfied to hand out money and be charitable? Is it just enough to be good? No, the Bible said all your goodness is filthy rags in your sight. No, 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 no. He says, love me with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Love me. Give me your heart. Folks, I heard that and I'm doing that. And I am so enjoying because you see, the more you crave, because he, this man, Moses had such a craving heart. And God says, all right, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to give you my presence. But then he comes back again. He's so craving after the Lord. He said, now show me your goodness. And the Lord said, I'll show you my goodness. And then we got the goodness. He said, now show me a revelation of your glory. This man's not going to stop. I'm going for the glory. I'm going to get to know who you are. I want a revelation of everything about you, Jesus. I'm not here on this world to live for myself and just to say I've finished 70 years and, and, and so forth. Pa Paul's whole thing was not I, I fought a good fight and I'm, I'm ready to be delivered. No, it, it was that Christ revealed himself not to me but in me. In all these times, I have a revelation of Christ. I know where I'm going and I know who he is. When I get there, I won't be a stranger. I know him. Will you stand?